Well, good morning. morning. Now, welcome you this morning on that Sunday where we turn our clocks forward. It's a very special morning for two different groups of people. There are those of you that don't sleep well at night anyway, and you are thrilled that you can get up and come to church early. And there are those of you that regularly sleep during part of the service. (laughs) And on a morning like this, there's a special dispensation, no judgment, go ahead and enjoy your nap. (laughs) The rest of you, I invite you to stand for our call to worship comes to us from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, they were like those who dream. Then their mouths were filled with laughter and their tongues with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord. They who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. The one who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall shall come come home with shouts of joy. Let's pray together. Father God, we're grateful to be gathered together this morning to worship you. We thank you that we have a reason to come together each week to celebrate the life, the salvation that you have provided us by grace through faith in your son, Jesus. Father, at this time we confess that there are times in our lives where we try to do everything on our own. We try to live this life in our own strength, to take matters into our own hands, to conquer our own sin by ourselves. But we confess that arrogance, we confess that pride this morning. We thank you, Father, that we have an advocate, an intercessor, a great high priest who stands before you on our behalf. And so, Father, I pray this morning that you would remind us of our dependency on Christ and his spirits, that we would recognize that this life is far too difficult for us to live in our own strength. 
but we have a superior high priest that we can go to for strength. We thank you so much that Christ is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so, Father, I pray you'd encourage our hearts this morning, remind us of these great truths, that we have someone who knows exactly how we feel day to day, who can empathize with us, who understands our frailty and weakness better than we do. And so, Father, I pray this morning that we would be renewed in our reliance on Christ. We pray all these things in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
The book of Hebrews is a pilgrimage looking toward the holy city and a kingdom that cannot be shaken, the holy hill Mount Zion in heaven with our Lord. We're going to sing a new song to the Lord today that comes from Psalm 126. Would you please stand as we sing together, we will feast in the house of Zion.
please be seated. Good morning and welcome again to Upland Community Church. Children, at this point in our service, you are dismissed to Children's Church. Let's spend a few moments praying together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ to join our hearts in worship of you, of your Son, by the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, one God, forever blessed. We pray that you would be magnified and glorified in our worship together, not because we are good, but because you are good. Not because we have loved you, but because you have first loved us and have placed your love within our hearts, allowing us to love one another and to allowing us to love you, which is a miracle of redeeming love, for we are by nature sinners living in enmity with you and with one another. And so we thank you for giving us hearts of flesh, for changing us from hardened criminals to those who are able to give and receive the abundance of your love. So we pray, our Father, as we join our hearts together, not only in the singing time, but in the hearing of the word preached, that you would give us a profound sense that we are your children, but that we are also brothers and sisters in Christ, united formed into a new family, family from strangers and enemies. So we pray, Lord, that if we have bitterness in our hearts, if we are struggling to forgive one another, that you would, that you would give us, that you would wash over us ways, waves of forgiveness, and that you would thaw our hearts. But we offer this to you as uh, a gift in our weakness, understanding that it is impossible for us to muster up the goodness simply by pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps. We need your ever gracious, sanctifying presence in our lives. So we pray, Lord, that you would continue to form us into the image of your son, the Lord Jesus, the most beautiful one, the one that we've been singing about, that we long to see face to face, that we long to know and Father, we pray that in this moment, while we long for his return and pray as a church, come quickly, Lord Jesus, that we would experience his presence through the mystery of the church, which is called the body of Christ. So as we long to see you face to face, may we greet one another face to face, recognizing in the other the divine image, that we may forgive and love and cherish and nurture Pray, Lord, that we'd use our spiritual gifts, these bestowments by your grace in our, in our midst to wash one another's feet and to experience the washing of our feet. Bless us, Lord, as we covenant together, as we fellowship together, as we journey toward you. And Lord, we acknowledge that this is not a me, an end in and of itself, but that the church is on mission, that we are observed and watched by a world in need that does not understand this redeeming love. And though they may some be compelled, others will despise it and persecute it, call it all manner of names. We recognize that our Lord too was despised and rejected and called all manner of shameful names. So we will pray, Lord, that you'd help us to not retaliate, to treat hatred with hatred, but that we may be silent in the face of our accusers, gentle and meek and lowly, willing to extend forgiveness even when we, are, when we are mocked and despised. And so the world watching, whether they respond by being compelled or with persecutions, we pray that our witness would be bright and shining and faithful, and that you would use us to bring many, many more worshipers into your kingdom. We pray this for Upland, we pray for Indiana, we pray for the United States of America. We pray it for the world. Bless us, our dear Father. There are people in our congregation that need healing. We pray that you would bless their bodies as they recover from surgery or from illness. Be with them. We pray also for those who are, under, are in despair and need encouragement that you would provide for them. And we pray for those who are strange that you would help forgiveness to overcome hatred, difficulty, and misunderstanding. 
It's in the strong name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ the righteous. And by his Holy Spirit, one God forevermore, we pray these things. Amen. Would you please stand for the reading of Holy Scripture? Our reading today is from Hebrews 7. Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement requiring a bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were presented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. But it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. This is God's word. Please be seated. We tend to be remarkably resistant to change. There are things that we like, we've decided we like, we've become comfortable with them, and we're not interested in somebody coming along and changing things. <clears throat> Coke had not changed its formula for 99 years. Then in 1985, new Coke was introduced to replace the familiar Coca-Cola. It's still considered one of the biggest blunders in marketing history. New Coke lasted 79 days. And then Coca-Cola Classic was reintroduced. It's just the old formula with a new name. They actually were sold side by side for a while, but finally after 17 years, Coke just got rid of new Coke. They decided no one really wanted it. They said, we really failed to understand the deep emotional attachment people have <laughs> for things that they do every day. You know, last week, we saw the glorious promise of perseverance, where believers are given hope in a coming inheritance that is anchored in God's promise 
God's name and God's son. This hope in a coming inheritance will lead believers behind the veil, the veil that is hung between sinful humans and a sinless, sinless God since the beginning. The risen Christ will serve as the new high priest going before believers, covering their sin, that they may then be in God's presence. But is the risen Christ, is he really better? Or is he just different? Christ isn't presented as someone to stand alongside the old high priest. He's presented as one to stand in place of the old high priest. He's the new priest of the new covenant. But there was some doubt. Emotions ran high. They had had the law for 1,500 years. The office of high priest could be traced all the way back to Aaron. Is this something that we're really ready to just release and abandon? Now, on the surface, Hebrews 7 may not seem that important to us, at least not as important as it was to these Hebrews, and that may be because we are very slow to admit and even recognize who and what we are using as a high priest to serve alongside our Lord Jesus Christ. We are accustomed, we have become comfortable to having inferior mediators. It may be a friend, it may be a family member, it may be a pastor or a counselor or an author who we have become very comfortable being between us and a holy God. They're the one that we depend on. They are standing where only Christ is authorized to stand. Certainly, such individuals can be a blessing in our lives, but not if their presence is keeping us from confronting and confessing the very sins from which Christ came to save us. My hope is not in being accepted with my sinful nature intact. My hope is being accepted by the one who can recreate me without a sinful nature. It's a very different hope. The hope that we will not have to change is not a hope. The hope that there is one who will free us to change is our real hope. Our outline as we look at Hebrews 7 this morning will go like this. We'll see that Jesus is the new priest of the new covenant. We'll first look at this rather obscure character, Melchizedek. He is a Canaanite priest king. What is his significance as a contemporary of Abraham? And we'll look at Jesus, the Judean priest king. What is it that certifies Jesus alone to be the new and necessary high priest that we need? And then we'll look at the better covenant, the one that is mediated by the right Priest, What is it that is confirming the risen Christ as the right priest for all humanity, not just for these Hebrews? So we begin by looking at Melchizedek. This, is a, this isn't Melchizedek, by the way. <clears throat> this is a sculpture of a priest king uh, from Pakistan. It's dated around 2000 B.C. It was unearthed in 1925, and it just gives us more evidence of the presence of priest kings in that time period. A little bit about the setting. The Hebrews were very used to using inferior mediators, using things that could function as co-assessors to God Most High. And some of these may be a little familiar to us. For one, they would use their lineage, that we are sons of Abraham. They had said this to the Lord Jesus Christ when they were there. We are sons of Abraham, and that is what entitles us to be in God's presence. 
And Jesus responded to them saying, you know, God can make these stones into sons of Abraham. So that doesn't qualify you. That doesn't prepare you to be in God's presence. They also use the law. They have Moses in the law. We are the ones who were given the law. And that is what entitles us to be in God's presence. And it's pretty clear from all the Gospels, especially you think of the story of the tax collector and the Pharisee, or the IRS agent and the celebrity pastor, and you realize that in that story, that celebrity at the end was not qualified to be in the presence of God. It was the tax collector, not the one who knew the law inside and out, but the one who was humbled by what he knew nationalism. They were saying, we're Israelites. We're God's chosen people. Surely that is what entitles us to be in the presence of God. But it's very clear in the Great Commission that God chooses from all peoples and all nations. Now, a little bit of background then on this Melchizedek. Where does this obscure guy come from? He only gets a few verses in the Old Testament. And the history comes from Genesis 14. What had happened was as Lot went off to live in the area of Sodom, while he's there with his family, the kings come down from the north and they attack the kings of the south, which wasn't an uncommon thing. If you don't grow anything, you just steal other people's fruits and vegetables and cattle and other people to be slaves. So they would go down and raid and they stole. And one of the things they stole was Lot and his family and took them north. Abraham is told about this and Abraham gets together 300 men to go fight. I forget if it's four or five kings and probably thousands and defeats them up north of what is now Israel. And this is what we hear. After Abraham's return from the defeat of these kings, the king of Sodom, who was one that had been, or at least his people had been captured, he went out to meet him. He went out to meet Abraham to give to Abraham great gifts for what Abraham had done. He was recognizing that, Abraham, you are a better man than I am. You are greater than me. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, he brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, or God Supreme, Elohim. He was a priest of Elohim. And he blessed Abraham, and he said, Blessed be Abraham by Elohim, God Most High, the possessor of heaven, or the creator of heaven, or the one who owns heaven and earth. And blessed be that God Most High, who has delivered you, who is sovereign over all things and has delivered your enemy into your hands. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. That's four verses. That's what we get. And from those four verses, we see that the king of Sodom is giving to Abraham because Abraham is greater than him. But the king of Salem is receiving from Abraham. Abraham is recognizing something about Melchizedek this king, this priest of God Most High. So what is so significant about this obscure contemporary of Abraham? Well, this is what we hear in Hebrews, that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God Most High, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and he blessed him. That's what we just read. Now we're reading it again in Hebrews 7. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He's greater than Abraham. He's priest of God most high. He was a Canaanite priest king. There's a lot of archaeological evidence that there were Canaanite priest kings, that that was the dominant um, religion before Baal worship came in. And Abraham blessed, was blessed from him. And Abraham presented a tithe to him. So Abraham's receiving a blessing from him, recognizing this Melchizedek as someone who is a priest of Elohim. And he's presenting a tithe to him for that same reason. And his name tells his story. 
He's first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. He's also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. King of Salem, king of shalom, king of peace. Salem is the same place as Jerusalem. And his name is Melchizedek, which means my king is righteousness. His name is telling his story. And he resembles the son of God. Now, it gets a little tricky here, and this is where we can go to seed on poor Melchizedek. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. He continues a priest forever. Now, a literal understanding of that makes Melchizedek a pre-incarnate Christ, and there's some that would hold to that, that this is just Jesus showing up before the incarnation and being present before Abraham. But that doesn't have to be. He could also be a type of Christ, which is a little easier to embrace. He's presented like the Son of God in that he is not, there's no recorded genealogy of him. And this is something that's significant because that's uncommon in the Old Testament. Lineages offer an identity they're identified by their lineage. You think of uh, stories in Nehemiah, Nehemiah. If you can't prove your lineage, you're toast. You're out of here. But Melchizedek comes without any recorded lineage, and he has no burial. Burial secure history. No, he was just on the scene, and there's no record of his lineage or his grave. The Nike sign is on there because I just I was listening to something this week, and um, a pastor was saying that these types are like the Nike symbol. You can recognize a type because something happens and then suddenly you can look back, the swoosh goes backwards and realize, oh, Melchizedek was a type and then that sends you forward. If that is no help to you, then forget that is actually on the screen. <laughs> but he wasn't recognized as a type of Christ when he came onto the scene. It wasn't until later when things happened and they could look back and go, ah, we understand he was a type. He was greater than Levi, the priests of the old order. Those descendants of Levi have a commandment to take tithes. They had to take tithes because the Levites had no land. They didn't have a land for an inheritance. What did they get for an inheritance? They had God for an inheritance but they still needed food. So they took tithes from the other tribes. But this man received tithes from Abraham, and he blessed him who had the promises. And so it's beyond dispute that the inferior Abraham is blessed by the superior Melchizedek. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal man, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. So the Levites took priests, took tithes from Israelites because they lacked land. Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham because of his position. The Levites' deaths, they're recorded. They're mortal men. We have their deaths on record, but Melchizedek, his death is not recorded. It's figurative speech. He also has this beautiful line. One might even say that Levi himself paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Those of you that are literalists, this is not a lesson in physiology. This is just a statement that as an ancestor, as Abraham was the ancestor of Levi, all Levites essentially were paying tithes through Abraham. So what do we take away about Melchizedek? I would tell you he was a type of Christ. He was a king of Salem, a real king in the flesh and blood. He was a priest of God Most High. He was a real pressed priest who served the God Most High, Elohim. He was greater than Abraham. That is the explanation that we get from the writer of the Hebrews. He was greater than Levi. That is the explanation that we get. No beginning or end, I would tell you, that is figurative. And that is what makes him a type. Now that is the story of Melchizedek. Now we come to Jesus, the Judean priest king, who he will be compared to. Now, again, 
this was a huge leap for them. It may not seem that big a deal for us, but there was a boundary created by the law that kings were from one line and priests were from another. Kings were of the tribe of Judah, the descendants of David. That was clear. Priests were descended from Aaron. They were of the tribe of Levi, and there was no crossover. Crossover created a problem. Those who had tried to do it, it didn't work out well. And probably during the intertestamental period, before Jesus came onto the scene, there were lots of abuses of those that were kings that were trying to serve as priests. So this is an odd thing. But you did have a few verses that had always created great wonder. And one was a psalm of David, Psalm 110. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. That's king language. Rule in the midst of your enemies. That is king language. That is not odd. But then it gets odd. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind that you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That is very odd. That is talking about the line of David. That is something that is very odd, and they didn't know how to interpret that. We come to Zechariah 6. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch. The branch you'll see in Isaiah and Jeremiah. It's terminology that's talking about Christ, the rising up of Christ out of the stump of Jesse. A branch shall come. He shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne. That's all clear. That's kingly language. And there shall be a priest on his throne. What's that? And the council of peace shall be between them both. You understand why there's some confusion As someone comes on the scene and says, Jesus, of the line of David, is the high priest. What certifies Jesus to be this new and necessary high priest? Well, this is what we read in the passage. If perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, If someone had really been able to be fully cleansed of their sins, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after a different order, after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of Aaron? For Jesus did belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. Our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. He's very upfront. This means a new order of priests, but a new order of priests was necessary because the current order of high priest were representatives of the law. Their office was founded. It was secured by the law. The law teaches holiness that the law did not produce holiness. It didn't produce holiness in the priests. It didn't produce holiness in the people that the priests served. So there was a need for a new priest from a new order. A new covenant was needed. A priesthood that was not founded in keeping the law. But one founded by one who is holy as required by the law. He can cover the sins of the people. He can set them apart to be made holy. He's not of the line of Aaron. But can the line of kings really deliver a high priest? Jesus is an indestructible priest. Another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek who has become a priest, not based on a legal requirement, not based on the requirement that he be a descendant of Aaron concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. So what has happened? Jesus conquered sin. He is indestructible. For it's witness of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. A former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, and a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. He's qualified by resurrection, not by genealogy. 
He's conquered sin. He's confirmed holy by a perfect life, not by regular sacrifices. He lives forever because he was tested and found to be without sin. The old order of high priests was through genealogy, and that's set aside for a new order with a better hope in a sinless high priest who is able to lead us into the presence of God, to take us behind the veil. And that's why we have a better covenant that's mediated by the right priest. The new covenant is a better covenant. Paul explains this succinctly in 2 Corinthians 3. Our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of this new covenant. A covenant not of the letter, but of the spirit. Why is that? Because the letter or the law kills. It's not specifically that the law kills, but what the law does is it brings before every one of us the truth that we are sinners, that we are not fit to stand before a holy God and we will die in the presence of a holy God. That's what the law brings to us. But the Spirit gives life because it brings to us the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he died, that our sins may be forgiven and covered, that we may be in God's presence forever. It is a better covenant and it's brought to us by the right high priest. And what confirms that Jesus is that high priest? Well, first of all, he's the one that's sworn by God. Those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. They were simply descendants of Aaron. As long as they could show they were descendants of Aaron, then they may be chosen to be the high priest. But this one was made a priest with an oath by God, a sworn oath. By the one who said of him, the Lord is sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor, the underwriter of the new and better covenant. He's the priest sworn by an oath of God most high. And God cannot change his mind. The priest sworn by God. The priest who saves completely. We really need to just take this in. The former priests were many in number. They had this habit of dying. Because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. The priest descended of Aaron. What happened? They sinned. Sin brings death. They leave the job incomplete. They never finish the job. They kept trying. They kept doing work, but they never finished the job. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. He's without sin. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost or save completely those who draw near to God through him. Since he law always lives forever to make intercession for them. He's without sin. He lives forever. He will finish the job. He's able to save completely. He's not just going to work you through this stage. He's not just going to counsel you through this problem. He's just not going to be your coach in this season of life. He'll be there forever. He will know you fully, better than you know yourself through eternity. Take a minute And think of all those wonderful people that you depend upon. Those wonderful people that you love that maybe you wish could last forever. Maybe it's a family member, a teacher. Maybe it's a counselor. Maybe it's your doctor. You're hoping that you will die before he does or she does. Some are only there for a season by design. Some suddenly leave without notice. When that happens, you feel kind of empty. You got to start over. Someone who doesn't know your history, doesn't know your life, doesn't know your failures, your weaknesses, your concerns, your fears. 
Never will I leave you nor forsake you. There's no mortal that can make that promise. There's only the risen Christ that can make that promise. The risen Christ is suitable for a holy God. Because it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, one like him, who is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Who else could actually go behind the veil and serve in this role? He has no need to offer sacrifices daily like the other high priest, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself up, sinless. The word of oath appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The new priest leads us into the presence of a holy God as the mediator of this new covenant. He is the perfect priest, and he is a perfect priest. What does it mean that he's made perfect? The sinless Christ. He comes, he's sinless, and he's tempted and he's still sinless, and thus he's made perfect. Former priests were tested, and they were made sinners. After every sacrifice, Jesus was tested and remained perfect through every temptation. Adam, tempted, made a sinner. Jesus, tempted, made perfect. He's shown, he's proven to be perfect. Like, well, that's all real interesting. So now what can we do? What can we do? What should we do? Is this really of that significant? I know Jesus. I've read about him. He's my friend. He's with me. Who is this Jesus? If the risen Christ is not just the leader of a fad, or an upstart faith, or a Jewish cult. If he is the new priest of a new covenant, if he is superior to Abraham and he's superior to the Mosaic law, if he is the forever priest for all peoples and all nations, if he is sworn by God, certain to be here forever, if he is able to save completely, he will not quit before the job is done. If he is suitable to serve before a holy God, if he is the only one that can lead us behind the veil, then why might I be pursuing a different high priest? If that is who Christ is, and he is the only one that fits in that category, why is it that I am pursuing a different high priest? If I am pursuing someone or something else that I want to identify with that can be with me as I go through life, why do I balk at Christ being my high priest? Well, am I not excited about going in behind the veil? That's possible. That could be from fear. I, certainly, the Hebrews had some fear of what it meant to go behind the veil. Are we still fearful of being in the very presence of God? And would it be better in our minds to not be in God's presence? But I, could I just kind of be in the general vicinity of God? You know, could I be in the country, maybe at the foot of the mountain, but I don't want to be on the mountain. I'm not that excited about going behind the veil. There are things that happen back there. Sin is exposed. I'm not sure I want to go back there. I want to stay out here. Am I still clinging to my old nature? Are there things about me that I just love? There are things about me that make me different than you, things that I truly, truly have come to cling to. I just don't believe that what Christ is offering is better. I'm not willing to take that risk. I kind of like what I have. Am I losing hope? 
Am I losing hope? Am I just basically getting weary of this battle against sin? Am I losing hope that the things that I have craved, the battles that I go through, that it's ever going to go away? Here's a quote I want to leave you with. When you lose hope, everything changes. Your heart wants the opposite of what it really needs. That was said by Kalmar Wingfeather in The Warden and the Wolf King, the Wingfeather saga of Andrew Peterson. When you lose hope, everything changes. Your heart wants the opposite of what it really needs. I think there's a lot of people that are losing hope. I think we have an entire generation that is losing hope. When you look out and ask, why is it that they are wanting the very opposite of what they need? Why is it that I am wanting the very opposite of what I need? It's because we're losing hope. Why do we lose hope? Because that is the serpent's primary strategy to undermine the hope that we are given in the good news of the risen Christ. We're losing hope that we truly are given a new heart. We're losing hope that we truly will overcome sin through the power of Christ. We're losing hope that in eternity there will be peace and joy forever. We're losing hope that the ache of loss will be no more. We're losing hope that our sinful nature will only be a memory. And why are we losing that hope? Because we're not seeing Jesus exclusively as our only high priest, the only one who can lead us into the presence of God. Anyone that is selling anything else is deceiving us. Anyone that is trying to convince us that Jesus is less than he reveals himself to be and that God is not as holy as he reveals himself to be is deceiving us. And there is only one deceiver in our world and that is the Satan and he is working through the multitudes. Sorry, that wasn't in here. It just came out. In the risen Christ, we have a priest who will never leave us nor forsake us. He will take us behind the veil to our maker and stay with us. He will be with us for all eternity until we're completely who we were created to be. The risen Christ, he's the new priest. He's the only priest. There is no other. Please bow your heads with me. Father, you have given to us your one and your only son, and he is the one who is the right priest, the one that we need. Father, open our hands that we may release everything else that we hold on to, that we may cling to Christ first. And that you may add all these things to us that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand as you sing together a hymn of response.
Several things to be aware of. The spring bake sale is continuing in the equipping center, and it will be there for the next couple of weeks. Also, there are Stephen Ministry info classes that will begin next week week during uh, the Sunday school hour on March 19th and March 26th. That'll be in EC2. Um, Stephen Ministry is designed to provide Christ-centered care, and we are hoping to begin that in our church uh, in next fall. And in these classes, you will learn about the opportunity to be trained as a Stephen minister. And if you want more details, you can contact Shonda Freer about that. But the information classes start March 19th. Baptism, April 16th. We'll be celebrating that. If uh, you are a believer and you have not yet stepped forward in obedience to be baptized, I would encourage you to contact uh, the pastor, uh, pastor or contact the office, and we will talk to you you through that process. And then looking even further ahead on April 23rd, we'll have our Faith at Home Summit at four o'clock in the afternoon. Details are coming. Why do I tell you that now? Because if it's a glorious and sunny day, you shouldn't be doing yard work. You should be at Faith at Home. So put that on your calendar. And please receive the Lord's blessing that comes to us from Hebrews 4. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us in with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Take a moment to rejoice with someone around you.